glad that we had a five minute break to get you all um, introduced to each other a little bit more. We're going to play a video now for you um, of Olivier um, Arindel. And um, he is, we will have a, a video of one of his destinations that his airline flies to. So thank you so much. Flight Air France 741 to Punta Cana is ready for boarding. Flight departure is scheduled to be on time. That was such an amazing uh, video. And um, at this point, I'd like to uh, invite her. Yeah, I have to say, I am really struggling with this technology, but uh, hopefully by the end of this, I will have uh, uh, gotten better at it or somewhere along the way. Uh, just a little bit um, of, um, uh, you know, a, a little bit of uh, about Olivier. He is the ambassador at large of the ecumenical Knights of Malta and the CEO of Eva Airways. And um, he was the managing director of financial planning, investor relations, and corporate uh, planning for Grace Aviation Holdings. Uh, Olivier, I will just uh, let you take the floor uh, in the interest of time. Uh, I think I'll hand over to you now. Well, you know, good afternoon. And um, thank you so much for having me. Greetings from the Dominican Republic. Um, I'm in my office still, as you can see, working hard. And um, the video um, illustrated um, the 
reality of the Dominican Republic when it comes to the tourism sector. I am originally from St. Martin. I was born on a small island that is called St. Martin that is colonized by the French and the Dutch. And um, I live in the Dominican Republic now where I am establishing um, my airline, which will transport people from the Caribbean, Latin America, directly to Latin America and the Caribbean on to Africa and other parts. So I'm basically connecting the, the two, which is very close to each other, um, together. And I had the opportunity to kind of um, hear and listen to the um, other persons that speak just a while ago, especially um, the brothers and sisters from the United States of America. Um, I was educated there, but dropped out my second year from, from UConn. And I wanted to say <clears throat> um, in this um, forum, I can tell that there is um, a lot of um, black business owners, black people that are in business. And the common um, major problems that will always happen is the, 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 the discussion about money. Everything is about money. And for any business to strive, for anything to be done, it costs money. The simple question is, one self has to ask themselves if they really know who they are. And once you figure out who you are, you can now move forward to accomplishing the necessary. Um, one self cannot <clears throat> go and ask persons and network with persons that does not look like you, talk like you, act like you, or behave like you, to trust and also to, to give the necessary capital to um, what you're trying to do, especially to the brother that is trying to do his energy and, and, put, and projects and so forth and so on. So one of the things that has been challenging my company as well is, is the fact that investors are very hard to come by um, when it comes to the the persons that are controlling the necessary um capital that does not really tend to um look like up uh, look like us or whatnot so most of the shareholders of my company are african um descendant at this present moment um some of them are professional athletes some of them are in the uh, music business what I'm trying to do is capture the professional athletes and the, the, the persons that are, that are in those areas to become, you know, um, and worry about investing into organizations that can take, um, you know, the, the company uh, um, to the next level and invest with each other. And apart from that, I am also an ambassador at large of the Incremental Knights of um, Malta which is my social responsibilities as well that I do throughout the CARICOM countries and also here in the Dominican Republic. Now, one of my strong points is, you know, questions directly to me. I know that many have uh, 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 questions, but um, most don't like to ask tough questions. And sometimes I like to spark the mind with controversial aspects so we can all open up the minds and and be able to discuss the things that really bother us in in our community in our sector especially as african descendant people so um this forum allow me to ask you guys a simple question um who are you who are the people that i'm speaking to besides the names besides the profession who are you internally? What are you made of? What are your desires? Where do you really want to go? Why are you contributing your talents? Place does it needs to be contributed? Are you really a fighter? Are you really someone that really wants the development and the progress of African people? Are you really someone that wants to really invest 
for the development of Africa? Are you really someone that want people to stop taking advantage of your self? Are you someone that wants to be able, um, you know, to go further in life as an African person? Because it's very hard um, being black. And I hope that uh, some may disagree. And the hardest point of being black is that you're judged on day one for who you are, look like, but you're not judged for your intellectual capacity when someone find out that you have the intellectual capacity to take things to the next level. So my basic advice to most of you entrepreneurs in this room there is a book that is called The Intellectual Warfare by Dr. Jacob. Um, I think on Amazon, it's practically sold out. I'm going to find a link and I'm going to put the link inside of, of, of this um, medium when I'm done um, speaking. And this book would allow you to navigate the intellectual warfare that is happening at the present moment. You need to understand how do you identify an enemy? How do you deal with that enemy? How do you understand oneself? 90% um, of the investment sector, it's all politics. Um, one of the things that I have had um, struggles with whenever I speak to an athlete to do an investment, you always have to speak to the opposite race which is their financial advisors, which 90% of the time doesn't want to do business with you because no one does not recognize that economic discrimination does exist. And that exists throughout the United States of America, England, Europe, wherever you go, economic discrimination, it does exist. And that is the number one reason why investment opportunities from investors are not provided to a lot of entrepreneurs that has great companies from our race and demographics and we find ourselves becoming employees and this is where i am calling upon those that are wealthy those that has the financial capacity to establish their funds their equity firms their whatever and invest into the, 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 the diaspora of Africa into, you know, black organizations that can strive going forward in the sense of black organization that can be diverse. You can have um, the majority control of your equity supposed to be in black owned and your management can be a diverse management company with multiple race because I believe that management supposed to be based upon talent but investment um, supposed control supposed to be vested in oneself. For example, when you look at sports um, in general, in this century, um, it's, it's becoming um, evident, it's becoming evident that, you know, the easiest way for a, a black person to become wealthy is by sweating, is either sports, music, or some sort of stuff like that. But once you start to venture into the airline business, um, once you start to venture into things that change economies, now you start to get the different challenges. You, you start to get all of the tough discussions and, and all of the different sectors and investments are very hard to get. And what happens, these big banks end up taking our talents, give them good jobs at you know Morgan Stanley and all of these big banks. And then next thing you know, you know, the innovation of these, these these young black entrepreneurs are no longer available for the development of black wealth, um, but for the continuation, helping segregate um, black business and black wealth the way how I, how I see it. And um, one of the things that I'm grateful for coronavirus is coronavirus has really set the tone um, right now and set the pace back to zero that allow um, for innovative minds to be able to create new direction. But still, we do not have the economic power. 
we can have these conversations until kingdom come. But if we don't get together to establish the economic power and to support each other's business and to invest and the development of each other's companies and help each other's to grow, we will not get there. This is one of the fundamental things that makes the Jewish people very rich. This is one of the fundamental things that made a lot of um, other race rich um, besides the, the, the slavery aspect that gave them the jump start. But nevertheless, we as the black race supposed to be able to use um, what they have used and use that to our, our benefit and develop from that point. Um, you know, there are talented people in all sector of the world. If someone can accept who you are as a person, then you know, you are heading towards the right direction based upon equality on the same level on the table. But if you yourself don't know who you are as a black person, mm -hmm. how can someone accept you to be, you know, equal on the table? So, you know, my, my recommendation to that is to get to know who you are. So my, my conversation is about getting to know who you are because what is education? Why do you have this master's degree? What does that help? What does that mean when you have that master's degree or who you are? You know, it's, 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 it's tough questions that you got to look at yourself in the mirror to identify yourself. People live forever. And when they die, they still don't know who they are as an individual. And that is the sad part of our, our um, you know, demographic at this, pres at this present moment. So for me, you know, um, I'm not good at continue talking. I'm more good at controversial questions because I like to shake up the, the table a little bit because controversial questions allow us to think and allow us to be able to move um, things forward. We're having this discussion, I agree, but what is the end result? What is the plan? Are we gonna help each other out? What are we doing? What are we discussing? And, 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 and what the network is about? I have an airline. Are you guys ready to fly to Africa? Are you guys ready to move? I have an airline, it's there. What do you need? How do we get there? That's my point in this whole um, scenario. Absolutely, Olivier. Absolutely. I, I have to say that ultimately we we hope to um, uh, get a few solutions out of this event, uh, especially from sharing best practices and from the networking uh, platforms that have been organized uh, uh, by the team on the side. But it's a very crucial um, point that you raised that, uh, and we, as somebody is dialing in from Africa, I mean, at the end of the day, the question is, um, what are we, who are we, and uh, how do we want the world to see us, and how do we collectively uh, move towards development and bring everyone on board? Thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, in, I think that we're going to have to move on to our next panel. We had a few videos we had uh, prepared to play for you, but as we uh, uh, get them ready, I think we'll be uh, playing them at different times. Now, our next panel is, a, is looking at agency voice and empowerment, and it will be moderated by Dr. Aisha Jones, um, who is the executive director of Biotech uh, Institute based in Kingston, Jamaica. It's a premier research organization advancing Jamaican innovation. Now, Dr. Jones is also a trained biologist and ecologist, and uh, I'd like to invite her on stage to invite her panelists and uh, the speakers who uh, will be, you know, part of this particular conversation. Thank you so much, Maggie. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, so I know there are lots of different people from all across the world. So good morning, if it's morning, good afternoon, um, good night. Good evening, um, all here for the second panel titled Agency, Voice, and Performance. There is a, a well known quote that says that as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. 
These, of course, are the words um, from Nelson Mandela, former president of South Africa. And as people of African descent or supporting the cause um, for people of African descent, oftentimes we exist in a world where our stories um, and our contribution seems like a very small light in a very vast world of darkness. And our experiences are often underrepresented, very hard to understand, and oftentimes are just ignored. Um, but consider this being compounded when you are a woman who is also a neuroscientist serving one of the world's most advanced centers of excellence in medicine, plus a leader in deep sea diving. If you're a woman with cerebral palsy and also a beauty queen, a woman who has survived one of the worst humanitarian crises of the modern world, and a woman who is responsible for government and institutional diversity policies serving people of African descent and other minority groups in one of the US's largest and most diverse cities. Today we have four panelists who exemplify the very lights of which Mandela spoke. Their work and their advocacy are glimmers of hope that inspire us to let our own lights illuminate our world. I will advise, invite our panelists to take five minutes and share how their stories explain, to explain how their stories have amplified African diaspora voices and culture for collective action through agency voice and empowerment. We will start our discussion with Dr. Nevada Winro. <laughs> you would pick me first. Yes, you're gonna refer. <laughs> Good evening. How's everyone? Um, so, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Winrow, um, if you allow me to introduce you um, briefly, um, is, is, is a, a well-known um, John Hopkins trained um, pediatric neuropsychologist and has mm -hmm. served as a clinical practitioner and professor and administrator in higher education for decades. She is alumni of several well-known institutions, including the John Hopkins School of Medicine, Howard University, Lincoln University and completed fellowships in neuroradiology, psychoneuroimmunology, cognitive neuroscience, and neurochemistry. So, Dr. Winrow, you might have to explain all of that. Most of us. She, she, she's a she's a she's a Pisces. Um, yeah. <laughs> for the water. Um, so she is a, a, a an experienced paddy master scuba diver and mm. an associate of, of of the Women's Diving Hall of Fame and founder of. Black Girls Divers Foundation. What a profile. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to, to Dr. Nevado um, to tell her story and how her work has contributed to empowering the voice voices of people of Africa. Okay, well, thanks for that great introduction. Um, I guess I'll, 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 I'll get started from, you know, me taking my first steps. When I looked at the title of this panel of being um, was looking at agency voice and empowerment. You know, it took me back uh, to being a young adult or late teenager, so to speak, um, where, you know, I found myself being a teenage mother, um, leaving out of my senior year of high school. And, you know, there are certain narratives that go along with that. And I remember attempting to find that space. I already knew what I wanted to do in life. But because of that, that narrative about single, um, single mothers, particularly black mothers, you know, it was very difficult for, for people to take me seriously, um, let alone what I was interested in, because I've always been interested in the brain. Um, so, you know, you, you know, it was constantly, um, you know, telling me about the odds, the statistics about not only me being able to become a doctor, but, you know, finishing undergrad. Um, and I think it, it's from that experience, um, coupled with some life experiences um, that led me to um, shift a lot of my time and my resources to founding and developing Black Girls Live Foundation. Because again, it's about the agency, the ability to make choices for yourself. Um, that's in a benefit for yourself as opposed to others. Um, you know, feeling empowered in, in, in manifesting your agency. Um, 
So I think it, it, it was from that space um, that yielded Black Girls Die Foundation. Um, one of the key uh, aspects of how we operate um, at the foundation is giving young girls the, the safe space. It's not just about space, it's about having a safe space for agency, um, giving them a voice. Um, whether it's a decision on how we're going to go about doing things for that day in our learning to where we may go um, to apply all the things that they've learned in our program. Um, it's all, it's about voice. And I've been very particular because um, I, I, I get a lot of calls. They're saying, well, what about the boys? And the problem is when you introduce the opposite sex into the equation, we all know what happens to the voice of a young girl. Um, you know, a lot of people didn't get that, you know, at first. And I said, you know, you got to think back to when you were teenagers. You know, it's hard enough that these girls are smart um, and we know the propensity of us to be quiet when there's boys around. Factor that on wearing a bathing suit <laughs> because we're diving. So, you you know, you have that level of, of insecurity. Um, and bullying. Um, so, you know, the way that I've approached this endeavor is that safe space is about voice and not being bullied. Um, I think that is so key. Um, I, I am happy to see, I, you know, just looking at the data for the last five years, actually eight years, you know, I, I'm looking at the federal level that they are investing. Um, they're, they're starting to recognize the um, lack of diversity in the STEM workspace. So, I, you know, I'm happy to see that they are allocating resources um, to make it happen, to kind of close that gap in that pipeline. Um, but it, it, it's going to take a lot of work. Um, and it's about people who look like us um, coming together with our resources and providing opportunities for our youth to see us in a space that we're doing things that they may not have ever considered doing. Um, I, I think that's very important. Um, and also just a factor in with the foundation, it's not just the agency, um, the voice and empowerment, but it's also the development of the science identity in and of itself. Um, you know, historically, you know, and, and the research has shown, you know, you ask um, black children describe a scientist and the first thing they describe is a white man with gray hair and glasses and a white coat. That's related to science identity. They cannot identify seeing themselves in that space. And the only way to counteract that narrative and that subconscious is allowing them to see people that look like them in those spaces. Um, so that's what my whole life's work, um, along with my daughter, has been is providing um, those visions, those visual cues um, to assist in empowering them, um, the mentorship and allowing them to speak their minds without worrying about, you know, even if it's wrong, you know, I, I always believe that you, you can't have innovation without failure. So it's also about that space, that safe space that gives them the opportunity to fail, learn from those mistakes and move forward. So we have a very nurturing environment at Black Girls Live Foundation um, that we constantly cultivate. We're constantly innovating, finding other opportunities where to allow these girls to explore themselves in a science space. So I'm not sure if I quite answered the question, <laughs> but that's kind of, you know, what I've been doing. Absolutely. That, that that was great. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Nevada. I'm going to go on to the other panelists and then we'll have a little bit of, of answer, have some questions and answers if, if, if they merge. Um, so we're going to go on um, to to, cons to Consoli Nishimwe. Um, she is an author and a motivational speaker. And she, along with her her mother and her sister, survived um, genocide in the 1994 um, civil unrest um, in Tutsi, um, of Tutsi in, in Rwanda. 
Um, it really is a very amazing story. Um, and from, from that experience, she has become a very committed speaker and advocate um, and defender of women's rights um, and genocide survivors. She, she released her, her memoirs titled Tested to the Limit, a genocide survivor's story of pain, resilience, and hope. In recognition for her courage and accomplishments, Consoli has received many awards, such as the Study of African American Life and History Living Legacy Award. She was hailed by the Together for Girls organization in Safe Magazine as one of 50 global heroes who helped stop sexual violence against children. Ms. Nishimwe, we look forward to your story and the floor is yours. Um, thank you again uh, for having me. I'm so sorry for, you know, technology <laughs> issues. So I um, hope everyone can hear me better now. So thank you so much for having me. It's truly an honor for me to be part of this uh, event. So thank you um, for your kind introduction again. So thanks for uh, I think also Aspire for having me uh, tonight at the event. So um, as you mentioned earlier, i um, from Rwanda. So I'm a general against the Tutsi, which happened in 1994. Um, and part of my story, this happened. I was 14 years old. So, and that's where um, I experienced, uh, at the young age of 14 years old, I experienced a genocide my parents and unfortunately during the genocide um, uh, which happened during the three months period so I lost my my father who were, uh, and my three younger brothers was, uh, who were ages from nine and seven and 16 months old and many of my family members on both sides my grandparents and so and I survived with my mom and my aunt and my mom and my sister and um and a few other family members on the side so um and after surviving the genocide as you can imagine as the young girl so i really went through a lot of traumatic experiences but um i, I never thought i was going to be able to even tell my story to the world what i've been through but when i had um to talk about it i realized it was so important because um many of my fellow survivors um, couldn't even now tell their stories. So, and during the genocide, um, like many of you know, uh, women and girls uh, uh, suffer a lot because rape is used as a weapon. So which happened in 1994. And among many of those girls and women, I was one of them. So, and now, you know, I was raped and now I live with HIV as a result of that. So for me, uh, it really, that's one part of that was really hard for me to talk about. But when I, I really decided to tell my story, I felt like I was speaking on behalf of so many girls and women. And uh, also speaking out, I know that where there's a conflict or a genocide anywhere in the world, women are still suffering. So I needed to make sure that I am part of helping to make sure that such horrors won't continue happening in the world. So, and telling my story uh, really has helped a lot uh, my fellow survivors. Uh, We're not as many who talk about rape, you know, personally telling what happened to us, you know, as rape survivors during the genocide. And, um, and I felt like I needed to encourage them because for me, um, I, I want to make sure that we, all of us, are re, at least we begin our healing journey. So, and um, and for me, I wanted it to be part of helping them. So, even though for me it took me many years, but when I had the courage to do that, I felt in my own way at least I can use my voice. So, especially that um, realizing that how it has affected me not only physically, psychologically of my fellow survivors, some of them who went through the same thing I went through, live with even huge consequences, not only, uh, you know, living with HIV, some of them had kids from rape um, and who are now 26 years old. Others are living with even psychological issues, which they are still really uh, 
dealing with. And for me, uh, I really wanted to make sure, even though we are really a country that is thriving in so many ways, and the, our country has helped us so much in telling our stories, and um, we need to make sure that at least the new generation um, coming, at least we're not inheriting, you know, the trauma we, we, we carry within ourselves. So, and for me, using, you know, using storytelling, telling what happened, it's part of uh, making us that we are, that our stories are heard. Uh, and for those who deny what happened, because now we are dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, those who deny what happened in 1994, the denier of the genocide. And for us, I use the story to make sure the world know what happened. So, and for me, um, I feel it's been my life <laughs> since I started talking about it. And I want to make sure, at least for the part I'm here on Earth, um, to a better well-being of women and girls. <laughs> so um, that's why I do, and um, and hopefully I can write many books. So and and I collaborate a lot with many different organizations that help women and girls, especially uh, when it comes to <laughs> sexual violence. Yeah, Thank you so much. That, that was that was ever a powerful story, and and we'll explore you know some of your experiences so a little much. bit more <laughs> in in our question and answer session. Yeah. Um, is Wendy Garcia in? I realized she was popping in and popping out. Yes. Hi, okay. Hi Wendy. So we we'll move Wendy. on. I'm, I'm good. So we'll move on to to Miss Wendy Garcia, who is a chief diversity officer, um, in the New York City um, Pump Control. Um, she has a very long and successful track record of, of, of working in government relations um, throughout the U.S. Um, and she, in her role, she's responsible for helping to increase the contracting opportunities for women and minority-owned business enterprises in New York City. Um, she has helped led the Advisory Council on Economic Growth through diversity and inclusion. Um, and, and with over a decade of experience in government and in academia, um, she has really um, blazed a trail um, for so many women and minority groups um, in, in the city of New York. Because of course, that is an extremely diverse city and it's easy to overlook um, you know, so many of the different groups that are represented in that city. Um, so with that being said, um, I'll hand it over to Wendy to give her, her five minutes. On, on her story and, and her work in empowering the voices uh, of people of African descent. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Um, I think I just want to start off by saying what an amazing group of panelists that um, we've, we've gathered today. I've learned so much. I've been popping in and popping out of the conference throughout the day and every conversation has been just so fruitful, so amazing and much needed. Um, so I'm Wendy Garcia, I'm the Chief Diversity Officer for the City of New York. Um, as mentioned, um, my role is to look at contracts um, in the City of New York um, and really ask the question, um, how is the City of New York doing with women and minority-owned businesses? And looking at how that impacts regulation, looking how that impacts policy, um, and how that impacts the way we operationalize government. Um, many times when we look at the way systemic racism has been built out throughout all of these um, decades, um, we find it intertwined in the way we do business, uh, the way that we um, create policies. I think some one of the earlier panelists were talking about innovation um, and the way we innovate is impacted by um, diversity as well. So I, I have a tremendous role. I work with the controller of the city of New York to look at it through the lens of, of finance. Um, we are the fiscal watchdog of the city of New York. And uh, that means that we're asking all the hard questions around where is the budget going, who is it going to, and who's managing it. Um, and historically, that has not been a question that has been asked in the past. Um, New York City has 80% women and people of color, the vast majority of African descent. And one of the major concerns that I've seen in the last six years, last seven years of doing this particular um, 
work is that there are very low amounts of access that are going to communities across the city of New York. So we see numbers that are detrimental, like 5% of the contracts, only 5% are going to women and minorities. That's out of a $21 billion budget. Um, we see numbers like when we look at women and people on boards, uh, and we specifically ask how many people of African descent are sitting on boards. Fortune 500 companies, I think you had someone from, a, um, from an airline earlier, um, and those numbers are extremely low. I mean, you're looking at less than two, three, four percent, depending on how you break it down. But overall, you're looking at less than four percent. Um, and the truth is that we are the customers, right? And so, how is it that you have corporate companies across the world, global companies, and the people that are making decisions on our behalf don't look like us? One of the things that we've done in our office is that we have. Uh, create a transparency tool through accountability, through accountability um, called the Making the Great Report. And we launched this, this was a controller's idea, um, and what we did was that we graded every city agency in New York City on how they were dealing with um, women and people of color. As you can imagine, we were not the most uh, liked our first year of doing this because city government can be a little tough and bureaucracy can be um, and so at first people were kind of like, are you guys really going to keep doing this? Are these numbers really real? And we did it. We've been doing it for seven years. The first year the city got a D. Uh, this past year, um, before, this last year that just passed, uh, the city got a C grade. We see the number steady at $21 billion and only 5% are getting um, contracts. And one of the most important numbers that we found is, is the gaps between ethnicity within the minority groups. Um, we're looking at, con when we were looking at contracts by ethnicity, we saw that only 1% of the contracts were going to African Americans. We saw that the majority of agencies were getting F grades. Um, and when we dug deeper, we found major access issues around that, engagement issues around that. Um, and if we, went even further, and I'll stop there because I can go on all day about this. Um, we saw that it was really embedded in the way the city governs. And a lot of the blockage that was happening and that is happening still to this day is based on the way we govern our, our city. So we, for six years, called on the city to have a chief diversity officer, for it to be located in City Hall and in every single city agency because it's for those of you listening, you know, New York is really the Mecca. Um, and even if you are in, in California right now, or if you are international, if you're in another part of the world, you want to do business with New York. Um, and if we're creating barriers um, for people to come in, in a city that is so diverse, where availability is not an issue, talent is not an issue, um, then we have a long way to go. And really, we, 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 this is something that um, we have been uh, trying to solve for for many years. Um, we've had a few accomplishments. Um, one of them is that in our own office, when we started, we started at about 10%. Um, now I'm happy to say that we let almost half of our uh, budget is going to women and minorities. Um, when we first started and we were looking at who's investing with the city of New York, we choose who manages our pension funds, and that's a $200 billion pension fund, and it's the fourth largest. Um, we started at a really low number, and now um, we're seeing 25 and 26 percent increases in some asset classes. Um, we started mandating that our consultants recommend um, women and minorities as part of their contractual work. So if they were not doing that in the past, it was because no one had mandated them. Now we're doing it, and we said, and if you don't do it, you're basically going to be functioning out of contract. Um, so we tied diversity and inclusion and equity to consequences. Um, and we didn't just set goals in our office. We made sure that we had deliverables that were clear um, and that our vision was being reflected in the way we um, operated the office of the controller. 
you so much, Wendy. Um, so, so I have a couple questions for you. Um, um, Hermione, if you if you can tell me how much time I have for question and answer, so so I don't go too too far over time. There are two questions for you, Wendy. You know, many of us um, are now, you know, managing projects, managing organizations, and and may now have a voice or an opportunity to establish our own institutional policies around diversity. What what would kind of be like that next step? How would you advise, you know, the, the participants who are here now who have influence or an opportunity to to voice um, diversity policies? What what really should should be their the approach? That's question one. And question two, um, in light of, of COVID nineteen and it having hit New York as as terribly as it did, yeah. Um, yeah. What is the experience of of of, of of black and and minority owned businesses in how have they been hit relative to 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 to, to the rest of New York City um, and and what what is your organization um, your your role doing to try and help support those businesses and and how can we learn from that while we're still going through 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 a pandemic? Yeah, those are excellent questions. Um, so I'll, I'll start with approach. So if you're on the call and you're listening and you are the CEO or you are doing um, management work in your organization, there are very clear items that you can do today, right away, without needing some major overhaul of the organization. Um, and I'll go through, I'll do the top, the top three, just to keep it succinct um, for the panel. Number one is if you're the president of your organization and you don't have a chief diversity officer, um, you you are um, you're you're creating a gap already within your institution. You want to make sure that you hire a chief diversity officer, someone who understands how to look at systemic discrimination from an institutional perspective. Remember that hiring the chief diversity officer is not just to say we hired a CDO. Great. That's not the issue. The issue is even if you have a diverse organization, even if all your employees are diverse and from different parts of the world and the country, it doesn't mean that your company wasn't built on keeping incumbents in and new people out. It's a very, there is a very clear line. And then that is what overlays over to people of color. So you want to make sure that you hire someone that can look at these three aspects. One, your supplier diversity chain um, and create targets around that. Um, I believe in set-asides. I have strong belief that that works. Um, that is what dismantles it in an aggressive way. Um, and we have to, it's, it's almost like any disease, right? Racism is like any disease. Like you have to treat it. If it's extreme and violent, you have to treat it in an extreme and violent way. So you have to do set aside and you have to do targets and create items around that. Number two, you have to make sure that um, that person is also looking at your hiring practices. Who are you hiring? Who's on top, who's on the bottom? Who's making sure that um, when decisions are being made, um, you're bringing in the right group of people that not only offer you diverse backgrounds, also diverse skill sets. There's been lots of research showing you that homogeneous uh, participation in any group and decision making is costly both for your company and for organizations. So you never want everyone in your group to look the same, just like you don't want a bunch of white males making the same decisions because they're going to come up with the same decision they made 10 years ago, which is probably what's going to cause you that in, in the long run. You, you, you want to have that. You want to have this person look at your your policies and your practices outside of supplier and and uh, outside of the supplier and the hiring. And what I'm really talking about is how do you operationalize? What are the rules? Like what's the culture of your organization? Um, how do people move up the ladder? Um, and for government, if you're government, in, in my case. Um, when I when we're looking at rules and regulations, is how are we commissioned? Like, how do we create? Are we creating criteria in any aspect of um, citywide that's creating barriers for someone to um, to access our office? So that's that's number that's number one. Um, number two is engagement is critical and super important to this process. 
we don't all have the answer. Just because you're a woman or a person of color doesn't mean all of a sudden you woke up and you know how to do diversity. You may have experienced discrimination. You may understand what it feels like to, um, to experience racism, but not everyone is an expert in institutional dismantling of racism. So you wanna make sure that um, you're engaging experts. Engage people who've had experience engage people in your organization, and that has to be ongoing. So for example, we all have unconscious biases, no matter who you are. And so one of the things that is critical to an organization is your, how your employees make decisions. Something you can do today, right now, is mandate unconscious bias as, your, as, a, as a training for all your institution. That's easy. You can literally find vendors that are plenty. Most of them are women or minority-owned businesses, and they do this for a living. And you train everyone in your organization from top to bottom, from the CEO all the way to entry point folks, because everyone in that company is coming in with their own bias. And what you have to start is that you have to start with the individual. So then when you begin to implement policies and the CDO comes in and all these other things come in, you have a culture in your organization that is willing to embrace that. Number three is that you got to create consequences. This is the part no one likes. Tracking and measuring what you do is critical. So you want to have a tool that not just uh, sees if you are increasing your numbers through supplier and hiring, but that if they are not increasing, that you have rules in place for the people who are not on board. And that's hard for people to do um, because no one likes change. But it's just like anything else in, in life. If you do not deliver good food, I'm going to take something really, then I cannot pay for it if I go to a restaurant. If the food is raw, then do you pay for it at the restaurant? Never. It, this is nothing different. You want to make sure that you are creating a space at your organization where people understand and not only is this priority, but it's based on the way they do their job. And the way they do their job is evaluated by the way they see diversity. That's how high you want this to get in your organization. That's what we've done in our office. We have found many challenges. And I tell you, we have failed many times. We have also done really well. Um, and I am only telling you this because the first couple years was a little hard. <laughs> um, and then we figured it out. But once you get it um, and your organization gets it and people on board, it really it, it takes out. It, it, everyone really becomes a chief diversity officer at the agency. Everyone becomes an ambassador. That's what we're seeing in our agency for sure. Um, and it, it, it's, been a, it's been a nice ride to watch. We have a couple more minutes for, for questions, um, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Winrow um, next. Um, so you, you you spoke about your story of 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 of, of triumph, right? As a teenage mother, um, having a very kind of specific interest, you knew you wanted to be a scientist, you knew you wanted to be in the medical field, um, mm -hmm. and somehow you never allowed your trials. To prevent you from 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 achieving your triumph, you are now mm -hmm. mentoring young girls, some of which who may be going through their own trials. Um, what what can we learn from from your method of mentorship, on particularly for young people, particularly for for for, for girls, particularly for those of African descent who are currently going through you know a tough time? You know how how do we mentor them as 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 you know? As, as we engage, you know, different people in our work, uh, what can we learn from your lesson in, in helping to push push those currently in, in, in trials in, in in achieving their own trial? I think the the most the key thing is mentoring unjudged. Um, everyone has their own paths. Um, everyone has their own challenges in the way that they attempt to navigate those challenges. Um, in my experience, I've you know just being at other places and, and, and watching people uh, attempt to mentor. My first thing is, it actually is a theory behind mentoring. Go back, you know, if you want to be a mentor, read about it. Read about the process and the paradigm, the the, the uh, psychological constructs 
and social constructs of mentoring. Um, but with working with young girls um, in that space, it's allowing them to be authentic um, and not being judged. I think one of the biggest obstacles with girls and being able to utilize their voice and share their experiences is fear. Fear that they're going to be judged, that they're going to be looked at differently. Like if I tell this person that I've been raped, are they going to look at me differently? Are, are they going to value me less? Um, and it has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with the other person. <laughs> um, so it's, it's one, keeping your values in check. And don't project your values onto theirs. So it's allowing them growth to develop their own value system. Everybody's value system is unique. There's some similarities, but everybody's got their own thing. Um, and it's about giving them that space to explore their 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 conventions, their convictions, um, and being able to discuss them without feeling judged. I think that if you can accomplish that, you I mean you're 85 percent there. And, I, and some people think it sounds easy, but it's not. We're human. Um, we all have implicit bias um, and, and, you know, judgment about the way we think things should be or how they should, you know, or how they are is about setting all that aside and letting that young girl be authentic and discuss her experiences, um, her solutions. Sometimes the solutions um, don't work, but it's okay. It's recognizing that, okay, that solution didn't work, but it's the recursive thinking to go back and say, well, what could I do differently? I don't like to get the girls hung up in what they did wrong. It's about what they did right in the journey to get there. I think, I think that's, that is the key component. And to mentor without judgment, well said. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, I haven't seen our fourth panelist, but I'll, I'll just give another throw just in case. Janeiro Obregon, if you're around, you can hop on. Um, if not, then I'm, I'm just going to run the, to, to the very last question um, to Consoli. Um, so there are some stories that are very difficult to tell, um, and they're just as difficult to hear, um, such as you know many of the stories that you spoke about today. Um, genocide, civil war, rape, sexual abuse, death of, of family. But those are very hard and sometimes uncomfortable things to talk about. And they're also uncomfortable for, for, for people to hear. Um, in your experience, since you have experienced, you know, I mean, you know, your, your experience is really such a unique, um, a unique story and a unique voice. Um, how can we, um, whether as mentors, whether as employers, whether as partners in the community, how can we um, encourage telling those stories that are difficult to tell and difficult to hear so that we can empower um, those who, who need that empowerment so, so that they can get on the path that, that you are on despite having, having, uh, having survived um, having survived genocide, how how can we how can we make the storytelling around these uncomfortable um, areas of life um, more acceptable and and more more sustainable? Right. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So um, before I uh, actually answer your question, I I actually come in the where talking about painful experiences is not very easy. Uh, for me, going the path of being vulnerable and the painful experiences without even knowing um, how, whether I'm going to continue doing this. So for me, uh, one thing I feel like uh, I've been blessed about is uh, people listening. The, you know, taking their time to listen, which helps us so much, and um, and in receipt, and uh, it really has in my journey of sharing my story, and also my healing journey it helps in your healing journey. So, and uh, and it's important for uh, many people to um, to give a space without judging how people tell their story because you are different the way we share our stories. 
And sometimes when you've experienced something like uh, like what I've been through, especially rape, and uh, it's not very easy to find the words to sometimes express, you know, what happened. So, and I, in my culture, we don't necessarily talk about our bodies and what happened, you know, like it's not very easy to even share what happened to your bodies. So, and sometimes, um, you know, for me, looking that path of when I got to a place where of shame. And also I found that um, it's also my part also to uh, being part of also everyone, help others, fellow survivors around the world who have been through not only but sexual violence, which is a very uh, painful thing to share, um, and uh, giving them a platform of sh of not shaming. Sometimes the shame is a big part of where many people don't share. And you find victims always are, are being blamed sometimes. So, or even the, you know, these uh, language to make someone who's been through something becoming more uh, painful because of what they, they hear. And I think... Um, I, I think that uh, it's important to give girls and women the platform to be able to share and support them in that journey of sharing. So, and I think many people are, and so, and I think uh, it will help uh, many, and also the culture of um, um, impunity. So if we, if we also not encourage the culture of impunity, I think many women and girls will be able to share what they've been, and even what they've been through. So, and I think uh, it's it's important for all of us to to make sure that really, um, you know, is 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 done well. So, and I think I found that Me Too movement also has helped in so many. Uh, make sure that uh, many of them are really. Um, able to share what they've been through. So, and, um, and and for me, and also to find the way of helping those survivors. You know, after after you know, therapy is important, and finding a, a, a safe place and therapy to, um, to 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 start their healing journey. So, and um, I don't know if I, sh you know, explain well with your question, but I think. We have enough time. Next time, I will definitely speak more on this. So it's one of my. Thank you so much. Heart, I think so. we're out of time. Um, Consoli, Nevada, and Wendy. I know you popped in and popped out. But, you know, just in case you you don't already know, you're you're amazing. Um, thank, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, thank you so much for for, for continuing to burn that light. Um, I know for a lot of you, it's coming from, from a place deep, deep in your heart, stories of, of trial and stories of crime. Um, it was an excellent panel. Thank you, everybody who's here who have, who have seen it. Um, I guess we'll be in and out um, in case you have any additional questions. Thanks again, first by Artemis Foundation for facilitating um, this platform and for inviting me to, 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 to moderate this, this, this very amazing um, panel of, of women. Um, I'll now hand over to Maggie. Thanks a lot, Aisha, and to the panelists. Um, thanks a lot for your time. That was really amazing. Um